Well, today I'm here with Eliza Mondegreen, who I'm very excited to speak with. Eliza is a grad student who researches and writes about gender identity ideology. So Eliza, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really happy to talk to you today. It's really lovely to finally meet you. I can't yeah. believe we haven't talked before. I know, me too. This is great. So um, so just to start off with, um, I was looking at your pin tweet thread I was revisiting today. It was probably something that put you on a lot of people's radars um, from 2021, where you wrote about your kind of foray into this topic, mm -hmm. your journey of thinking critically about trans ideology. And you talk about how you were um, you were involved in activism around abortion and mm -hmm. women's rights, and you noticed that the language was being policed, and that's kind of what sucked you in. Is that a fair summary or assessment of what happened? Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of there were a lot of things that I was noticing over time, but that encroachment of new taboos on women's speech and like organizing around women's rights was the first thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so you noticed that kind of taboo and that was what um, propelled you to speak out or was that just sort of what caused you to realize something was going on initially? Uh, that's what caused me to realize something was going on initially. It took several years after that before I started writing anything about it. And I think the impetus for that, it's always interesting to ask people like, what's the thing that kind of pushed you over the line? it was like, okay, I just can't sit this one out. Um, and for me, like for a lot of people, it was, puberty blockers was a big part of it. Understanding the kind, like, okay, these are drugs we use to chemically castrate sex offenders. We're giving them to children. They have unknown effects on brain development. Um, that was a big part of it. And the other thing was that I really learned a lot about online trans communities and saw how cult-like they were and saw how poorly the trans experience was represented by kind of, you know, the mainstream media puff pieces about finding your authentic self. Like when you're in these communities and you're reading people going through these, you know, really racking doubts about trans identity, it's like, this isn't about authenticity when people are talking about like, oh, how do I self-surveil myself all the time so that I don't stand like a woman or walk like a woman? Like this isn't, this is not being your true self something else is happening right right it's very much the opposite I mean it's interesting yeah. the the aut the authenticity thing because it's kind of like a cover for the fact that it's completely inauthentic so it's <laughs> like I'm really living my authentic self because you have to convince yourself that because yeah. it's such a uh apparent deception or lie or just falsity yeah, I mean, there are so many concepts that kind of get turned inside out when they touch this topic. And there are almost always concepts where it'd be really useful for people who believe in it to have the real concept to evaluate it. So authenticity is a big one. Um, yeah, like what's what's authentic about it? What's progressive about it? There are just all of these concepts where it's like, this does not mean the same thing anymore either. Right, right. Things kind of, the words have been played with and the meanings have been yeah. changed. Um, how did you end up studying this in, in school? How did this end up becoming your topic? Because I couldn't bring myself to research anything else. Every time I tried, like I thought about, I thought it'd be really hard to find somewhere where I'd be allowed to study it from a kind of a skeptical perspective. Uh if you've applied to grad school lately or like jobs in the nonprofit sector, which is where I came from, you will often be required to basically like sign on in advance to all of these ideological statements. So I I did not like my chances of being able to just study gender identity straight out. And I kept trying to find, you know, parallels, other things that I could study that would let me say stuff about this. Um whether it was like multiple personality and recovered memories or um, there were just, there were so many different options that I cycled through, but I just, I couldn't, I couldn't drop it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, yeah. I just couldn't translate it into some other thing where it's like, you know what I'm really talking about. <laughs> right. You had, you felt like you had to kind of just 
explicitly come out and right, say it. Right. It was like I wasn't gonna be like I considered just researching kind of disordered identity communities online. And of course, there are a lot of communities where there are parallels to the trans community. Um, but it just wasn't, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what yeah. yeah, that's, I hear that from a lot of people I speak with, you know, who I yeah. interview or talk with. They just had this feeling of being compelled to to talk about it, especially, I think, when people start getting pushback. And maybe of a certain personality type, when they start getting pushed back and being told mm-hmm. not to say something, being told that their perfectly reasonable, truthful speech is bigoted and hateful, that's when they really feel like, okay, I need to talk about yes. this. And it gives you the sense of urgency or like frustration, really, as well. Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. And I'm really curious about like, what is that kind of like heretical pedigree that some people seem to have where it's like as soon as you tell me like I can't do this can't think this can't say this like I'm gonna like that's exactly where I'm going yeah I'm curious about that too and I've asked a lot of people kind of what do they think that Mm -hmm. is and what have you found that to be what is that quality do you think that makes some people kind of like that or do that yeah I mean I think one of the big factors is what you're you're touching on, which is this kind of like allergy to any kind of coercion, even if it's under the guise of, you know, being really kind to people, which is another concept that I think got turned inside out where it's like, is it really kind to people to like lie to them and to push them down this path? Like, I don't think so. But um, I think that that is a really big one. There are some people who are, you know, kind of see things our way and will go still go along with a lot of the what you are I might call like you know the kind of bullshit around this and they're like well it's just it's not a big deal it doesn't affect anything I can still see things really clearly and there's some of us who just can't do that like I just can't (laughs) yeah it's hard to uh, understand or imagine I guess how someone could say like I can just accept that and I still see things clearly but I can pretend not to or I don't know if that's exactly what you meant but that's um, um I, yeah I mean things like using preferred pronouns when you could just avoid them is an example where people will be like oh this doesn't affect the way that I see something at all I guess I find that hard to believe people yeah have of course a choice over their own language but I find it very hard to believe that that wouldn't have effects on like your your thoughts and then of course it has effects socially when you're kind of participating in this fiction mm-hmm yeah, absolutely. So your cancellation, how long ago was that now? Because I remember that pretty well, but I can't I can't remember the date. Yeah, it was 2020. Um, okay. It was August 2020. And it, so I think that was really like the year of cancellations. Like there were so yes. many firings that year. Um, and, you know, that was also a, the year that BLM kind of exploded. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of just tensions were really high. Obviously, COVID was going on as well. So people were all at home kind of getting angry on Twitter and whatnot. Yes. Um, yeah. And and what about for you? Have you experienced any, you know, cancellation, um, harassment, stuff like that? Um, so very little. I think part of that is using a pen name, uh, even though a lot of people know my real name and where I really live and where I really go to school and all of that stuff. Um, I think the pen name helps somewhat. It's also it would also be pretty hard to be canceled as a student with a small stipend who, you know, like what are you really gonna take away from me? Who makes, you know, some income from being, you know, writing about this on Substack. Like it would probably help my Substack if I were canceled at this point. True. That is a very true <laughs> point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean it's just like it's just been some personal relationships and wondering it is really strange to have fallen out with a few people and then there are other people where you know there's a certain amount of as you you know move into move to new careers and move around the country or out of the country um just drifting apart from people but wondering if it was just natural drifting apart or if they have heard terrible rumors about the things that you supposedly believe 
Yeah, I've had the same exact thing. You know, I had a friend who um, she it was so so similar to what you're saying. She moved out of the country. I did it. But we also drifted apart. And I think the last time we talked was right around when I got canceled. And I remember she said, oh, that's crazy. And then I never heard from her again in ever. And also she was very much like pro queer. And Mm -hmm. I remember she was dating a guy who was a they them for a while. And this guy like treated her horribly, which is the classic thing, right? Like they use, they use the pronouns to cover up um, the classic male um, behavior. Yeah. It's even better than the like outspoken male feminist as a you know, it's a garb to put on. Yeah, as a cover. It really And you get is. to wear nail polish. So Yeah, they wear nail polish. Is this do you see this at your university? Like all these guys with nail polish and going by they them. Yeah, I do see a lot of it, although I think my university survival strategy has been to not be involved in campus life at all. Yeah. 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 And do are your professors, do you have like a good cohort and a good team who completely understand and like are with you on this topic? Mm-hmm. Um, so I've had an interesting experience with that. I'm in a kind of unusual program where there's just, there's a lot of people in it have like a clinical background of working with patients, although I don't. Um, and so I came to grad school and I totally expected that I would have like no friends and everybody would hate me as soon as they (laughs) found out what I was researching. And instead, like from the very beginning, I would talk to classmates, I would talk to professors, And I'd be like, you know, I really like I'm looking into this gender stuff and these online communities. And I really think that there's a lot going on there that's much more complicated than like, okay, these people were, you know, in some sense, born in the wrong body or whatever the narrative is. And I have had. And like I've presented my stuff in, you know, seminars, um, my research plan, my like initial findings, things like that. And have gotten remarkably little pushback. And I think that that's for two reasons. And one of them is like a lot of these people with a clinical background know these patients. And they know that there are other things going on with every single one of them. And that it's not a simple, straightforward case of like, yeah, this person is just transgender. Um, It makes it very hard to be offended about research that looks at kind of social influence and comorbidities and and other things. Um, And the other thing, although I don't think that it would protect me if I, you know, was unfortunate enough to run into someone who was really determined to cancel me, um, but I found it really helpful to just not use any of the language that you're supposed to use. Um, And it seems like any kind of concessions that you make when you're talking about this issue, like they just put blood in the water in my my experience. so my research is on, uh, you know, girls and young women in online trans communities. I don't call them, you know, natal females or biological females or assigned females at birth or whatever. Like I just say, like they're girls and women. This has never gotten me called out. Like it's you kind of you set the frame and then people are like, you're right. Yeah, girls and women do have a hard time with that whole puberty thing. It just it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I yeah, can see how that would really almost lead your audience to having a more open mind. Yeah, whereas if I came in and I was like, there are these trans boys, and I actually think that you know they're kind of having this experience of female adolescence. Like I'm, I'm totally you know muddying and undercutting my own points by accepting any of it, and I found that to be pretty good. Um. Once, like in once in seminar, I kind of presented some initial findings from my research. And as soon as I was done, every single hand in the seminar shut up and I was like, oh, shit. Um, wow. And there was uh, and there was one girl, and it was actually a little sad, who was really offended, but wasn't sure why she was supposed to be. Like she was kind of like off script, right? So she knows she's supposed to be upset about the things that I said. Like I talked about detransition, bad. Um, But she couldn't, because she didn't understand it well, she wasn't able to formulate good questions or push back effectively. So she was like, aren't you worried that your research in detransition could be weaponized? And I was like, do we not research things because someone could weaponize them in bad faith? And she was, you know, kind of like, wait a minute, you know? 
And every single other person in the class had, it was like they had been freed up to ask questions about something that they were just for the first time almost. So they had great questions about um, the online community dynamics. And it was like when you use that kind of, it's like when you don't observe the taboos, you kind of freak other people up to not observe them. Mm, and they're yeah. very curious and they feel like you're not going to try to like destroy their life like people tried to do to you for having some questions. So yeah, this must have gone really well. Interesting. So, I mean, yeah, I would say it's a great sign when every hand shoots up. They were so engaged. They were interested, you know, in what yeah, you had to say. Yeah, it was definitely like... Oh, I'm sure it was a little bit of like a heart-stopping moment yeah. of what's what's about to be unleashed. But, I mean, it sounds really great. And that's that's really, really interesting about how you opened up. You You made it so they could ask questions. And also how you didn't start from the defensive position. You're describing this like... Just you're not, like you said, backtracking and having to right. unprove all these other things before you even get started. You're just laying it out there um, without having to make all these concessions and go down their rabbit hole before trying to make your way right. back out of it. Right. Um, and then also how you asked the girl a question in return was, I think that's like perfect because <laughs> now was... you can put it back to her. Yeah, and she just, she had no answer. Like, like I yeah. said, she was like a little puppet whose strings had been cut. It was really sad. Wow, that is hilarious. That's a great description. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I remember being in a class in undergraduate um, mm -hmm. where the, um, we were assigned a reading on the New Zealand women's swimming pool, okay. uh, like not pools, like outdoor um, lakes and sure. ponds, I think. And um, was it New Zealand or Australia? I'm not sure. But anyways, we were assigned this reading about how, you know, men wanted to go swim with them, mm -hmm. men who were saying they were women. And the entire class, including the professor, was arguing in favor of this, except for me and one other student. Oh my gosh. It was a very strange experience. But um, so it's definitely, it can be very heightened in that environment. Yeah. So I'm curious, what was for you, what got you interested in the mm -hmm. first place? Yeah, well, it's funny because you mentioned the the time frame. You mentioned 2014, mm -hmm. 2015. That was the time frame for me when mm -hmm. I became aware. Um, it was 2015, the cover of Time magazine, Laverne Cox, and it said the trans mm -hmm. tipping point. And I remember um, I was at school in New York City, so I was right in the thick of it. So they had Laverne Cox speak at the school. So I was like, okay, let me see what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Let me see what's going on here because I'm completely in favor of gay rights and, and that movement. So this is clearly just the extension of that. So let's see what this is. And I was watching some videos of Laverne Cox and Janet Mock, who was another prominent trans identified mm -hmm. man at the time. And um, I just, you know, I was trying to see them as women and I just mm -hmm. couldn't. I just couldn't do it. And I actually, for like a second, you know, I tried for this one viewing session that I sat down on YouTube like I tried to see Laverne Cox as a woman and I couldn't do it it was just I knew I knew that that was a man underneath the yeah. facade because these are both people who kind of passed um Janet Mock maybe more more so but um yeah I mean definitely not Laverne Cox not by voice right it's always the voice that gives it away ultimately but yeah, it's always something yeah, it's always something, whether it's the voice or the hands or anything. But um, yeah, so I just, I, I never really, you know, accepted it or was, mm -hmm. um, or was into it. And then there were at the school that I was going to, the new school, this is such a, like a hotbed of woke ideology. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of guys like this who were okay. trans identified. And they kind of always had this like, click of women around them like adoring and you know affirming mm -hmm. them and but they were just these like narcissistic guys and so yeah. I just wanted no part in that and um that was what originally that was what it okay. was for me yeah what did you study by the way 
Um, then I was just studying humanities in general. Okay. I remember being in a class, a gender studies and religion class, and it was all girls except for one guy who was a they them. Yeah. And so that was very difficult as well. But I ended up dropping out of that school and transferring to um the City University of New York, where I studied Russian literature. So I kind of completely okay. left cool. that whole all the sociology, you know, interests and stuff because it was too it was too confusing to try to like communicate with these people. Um, so I just completely I was like, you know what, forget the modern world. I'm going into 19th mm-hmm. century Russian literature. So that's what I ended up doing. Yeah. It's like the internal exile of academia. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. Um yeah, and I was thinking about going, I never went to grad school or anything. I was thinking mm-hmm. about it, but I was wondering kind of what it would be like if it would be, like you said, that internal exile or, you know, it sounds like you've got a good setup there, but mm-hmm. are you on the, are you on like a PhD track? Are you going to be a professor? Um. So I'm, the PhD is something you apply for when you're done with the master's and I'm still thinking about it, but I probably won't go for it okay I started like I started grad school pretty late so for some you know I I don't really want to be on the job market and doing adjunct jobs in my 30s um and it's also it's just like it seems so unlikely for a lot of reasons not just research agenda that it would ever work okay yeah I think I need to figure out something else yeah, it's definitely, like you said, the job market is so abysmal. That was one of the reasons I didn't want to go into yeah. it for Russian literature, because it's like a very slim chance that you will have um, a yeah. decent job, a decent career, and you'll have to move to wherever you can get a job. Right. Um, and uh, so what do you think you might want to do instead? I would love to keep um, a kind of a freelance writing career going. I really love to like do research and writing on kind of mental health and trends within the medical profession. So that would be ideal. Okay, great. Why don't we also get into some of, you know, some of your research as well. So I'm curious to ask you about, um, so for these, you know, these young girls, their online communities and stuff. One thing that I find that I'm curious about is the girls who want to be gay men or gay boys Mm -hmm. and so I mean could we could you talk a little bit about that like what's going on with that I I know you know it's a phenomenon that um sometimes girls like gay guys and that that part I totally get because I remember being young and it's like you kind of like the maybe the more feminine guys until you get a little more mature um but what's going on with these girls who actually want to become gay boys I mean I think that you just you made a comment that definitely bears on it which is when you're a young girl like the kind of like now I can't think what we call them um the kind of dream boys of like middle school age girls will be kind of feminine boys like the Backstreet Boys or you know like Leonardo DiCaprio and like the Romeo and Juliet and Titanic time period with his long hair and he's pretty gentle and it's kind of like a safe road into heterosexual attraction that's not too scary like if you were going for like a super masculine sexed up um you know kind of romantic idol right away I think that gay male sexuality in these communities is both misunderstood and really like it's really attractive to a lot of these girls because they read fan fiction and you know kind of yaoi and other I don't don't actually know how to say that so sorry about um I don't know but fan fiction Um, and like anime okay so but I don't I don't know how to say that either but just to clarify that is like um, that's like gay gay male fan fiction yeah they're reading these things that are written by other girls okay for the most part Mm -hmm. and so it's a female females becoming attracted to gay male sexuality as imagined by other females Mm -hmm. identifying themselves as gay males on that basis and it's like this safe route to imagining having sex with someone you're attracted to which is a male 
without all of the inequalities that are, you know, social and the ones that are inbuilt, like, you know, risk of pregnancy, like just not being able to have the same kind of sex life that a man has. Mm -hmm. Um, And that being hard to accept, especially when you're really just figuring it out. Um, It's like the safe outlet for heterosexual energy. And then they come into these online communities and really, you know, love bomb each other with how valid they are and how unfair it is that, you know, gay men reject them. They also definitely are, I think, made more vulnerable by this identification to kind of unscrupulous straight men who have realized that there's this huge pool pool of straight women who, if you just pretend that you're a gay man and she's a gay man, you can, you know, do whatever you want. Um, and and it's really sad because these these girls are just like doubly cut off from an understanding of their situation and from kind of, you know, compassion and guidance from women who have a little bit more life experience than you do because they think that they're boys and because they think that they're encountering problems that women don't know anything about. And sometimes it's funny. Like sometimes it'll be like, you know, these gay trans guys online and they're commiserating about how they're straight male, but they think gay male partners don't know how to find their T dicks, which means clitorises. And it's like not a new problem. Um, And sometimes it'll be, you know, they're dealing with things like sexual assault and it's like, and talking about how extra traumatic it is that it happened to you as a man. And it's like, this didn't happen to you as a man. So I get the sense that like, there are things that are completely ridiculous about the ideas that, you know, straight, young straight women who are feminine are really fruity gay men, which is what they call themselves. Wow. But I think that they're kind of an extra vulnerable group because they're vulnerable to anybody who's going to play along with that delusion to have sex with them. Right. Absolutely. Um, Is that a coping mechanism when they say like a sexual assault as a man where they're kind of distancing themselves from the experience? I mean, yeah, I think in part because otherwise you would have to say I'm having this, you know, female experience. Like men do not, men can of course be sexually assaulted Men don't get sexually assaulted and then worry about pregnancy, which will have to come up in these communities. Mm-hmm. Like, never happened. Never going to happen. Yeah. So there is, like, a certain amount of cope involved in being, like, well, it's even more upsetting that this happened to me as a man. And now I'm having to deal with this, like, dysphoria trigger of, like, am I, you know, pregnant or... But it's just a terrible experience. And... Wow. Identity doesn't really have anything to do with it. Yeah, I mean, you're going in that thought process. You're going from here to here to here. It's got to mm-hmm. be incredibly confusing because you're saying, well, I was sexually assaulted, but as a man, but I have a pregnancy worry, but that's dysphoria because I'm really a man. I mean, it's... Right. There's But no... my body shouldn't work this way. Like... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, to me, it seems like there's two parts here. There's the... There's the girls who... They're like the first thing is the girls identifying with this which seems Mm -hmm. pretty understandable pretty natural but then there's the whole affirmation then there's the actual doing Mm -hmm. of the things and that's what I mean because you're describing this love bombing and this like cold like um bringing you into this community and affirming these delusions and that's what you know and then you've got the adults coming in who Mm -hmm are the authority figures um, who are also affirming it. And that's where it gets, that's where it seems like it's really pushed this social contagion over the edge into yeah. the girls actually acting on these things. Um, yeah. Would you say that's accurate where the first part is kind of more normal or like almost something yeah. that would be, would be normal? Like, I think the part that's really understandable is the ending up trans identified in our current culture where you know if you feel uncomfortable with any of the many things that you might feel uncomfortable about about growing up female or growing up gay or growing up any number of things that make you different from your peers and then as soon as you embrace that identification it's like all of these absurdities sprout from it and there are a lot of um I mean so I can only go on these online self-reports in my research 
course, people could misrepresent things, although I mostly get the sense that this isn't, you know, what these communities are for. Um, there are a lot of young people who have a trans identity that's primarily or exclusively online. Mm. And then they will, when they try to bring it out into the real world, it'll feel weird. Mm. And even when other people play along, like sometimes it makes it feel even weirder. And then they'll go back to the communities and be like, well, it doesn't make any sense that like I would feel bad about being called he, him or being called this new name or feel embarrassed or feel like I don't fit in with other boys. Because online, I feel really great being seen and referred to this way. Mm. So there's this kind of, there's this kind of like, you build this identity online where you really do have control over the information that you give people and the way that you want to be seen in a way that you will never have offline. You take it offline and it's weird and uncomfortable yeah. and it's not helping. Yeah. Okay, and then you go really back online Mm -hmm. To like manage the cognitive dissonance of that experience between, you know, your true identity and then how bad it felt to wear it out in the real world um, with a bunch of other people who have the same problem. Yeah. Like that is so much of what these communities are. Right. It's just like managing that dissonance of like, wow. how can this be my true self? And yet I feel like such a faker mm -hmm. whenever I'm interacting with other people this way. Yeah, so soothing that cognitive dissonance, which is so powerful and um, yes. so such a hallmark of an abusive relationship, too. But it sounds mm -hmm. like it's all, you know, self perpetuating. But um, it, it also strikes me as these girls not wanting to be seen as themselves and not being able to show up to intimate relationships as themselves yes. because they want to escape and hide who they are. But then when they go out into the real world, they are being seen like when you're behind your screen and you're just fantasizing and pretending and playing and you're just on the computer you're completely yeah. disembodied really but then when you go out into the real world you still have to be seen and yeah. you're still you like people will look upon you and look into your eyes and yes. see you and talk to you and refer to you in whatever way it is um and it seems like people just and I think it probably applies to some men, too. They are just afraid to show up as themselves, to be seen as themselves, and they would rather hide behind the screen mm -hmm. and not be them and pretend to be the opposite sex on on the internet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think mm -hmm. that that really gets at the kind of the self-rejection that I think defines transition and transidentification. It's just this... I think that there are, what it has shown is the idea of being born in the wrong body is an incredibly compelling metaphor for what a lot of people feel, which is just this sense of wrongness or misfittedness. And they found a social movement that says, you're right, there's something really like fundamentally wrong with you, but we can fix it. Yeah. And, and that's a pretty sad realization to be like, there, there are many people among us who, for whom that speaks to a very deep experience of just never fitting in and never feeling right and never feeling accepted yeah. and then they pursue a fix in a way where that acceptance is never going to be available because even if you pass perfectly and nobody knows and everybody accepts you you are being accepted for something that you're not which feels bad right right that has yeah. to feel bad that has to feel um you know confusing stressful and yeah. um and also it's if you do medically transition you're cutting off the pathway to ever be comfortable having you know a sexual relationship most likely um you're yeah. destroying your ability to do that physically yeah and hopefully i mean hopefully people who go through that and decide to detransition can recover yeah you know some of that comfort and accept what's been done to them but yeah it's like if you I mean, so many of these young people, they'll come online and they'll talk about, oh, I had top surgery and I think it didn't go that well. And now I, you know, I worry about ever being desired. And they'll say, they always include all of this other information where it's like, you can see all the other potential explanations for why they felt the way that they did. So the particular post that I'm thinking of, which was a few days ago about this mastectomy, the girl says, you know, I'm 24 and I've never had a relationship. And it's like, you know, she's never going to be able to have a relationship where 
she has her intact body and she never experienced it before she underwent the surgery. And that's just a really upsetting thing because it's like, this should be a huge, you know, I've never been in a relationship should be a huge red flag for any therapist, any surgeon who is going to like alter your sexuality in a permanent way. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrifying. I, it's, yeah. it's so, it's so sick. The, the yeah. doctors who are doing this. Um, And I'm curious to ask you if you have ever, if you have any like personal experience with, you know, with, with gender stuff or anything just in your life. I mean, for me, I know it's like, I didn't ever have gender dysphoria or any Mm -hmm. discomfort with one where I wanted to be a boy, but I definitely can understand, like I said, some of those things about, you know, maybe thinking gay guys are cute. I had a big crush on Adam Lambert for some reason, of all people. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember him, but he was, like, heavy on the eyeliner, and I was yeah, really yeah. into that. Um, but I, and then I also had, like, the normal teenage girl insecurities, and mm-hmm. I had, you know, at the time that I was in high school, there was social contagion of cutting, and I fell into mm-hmm. that. You know, I've said that before on here, and um, so that's a really recoverable one, though, Right. Um, luckily and for most people and um, yeah and I mean I see a lot of young women well like women like around my age who have mm-hmm. like these crazy scars all over them from cutting and I'm I'm lucky that I don't have anything like that but um, yeah. that one but generally that's a really that's one you can really leave behind um, in terms yeah. of social contagion but um yeah, so I'm just curious if you're, you know, if you if you're willing to talk yeah. about it. Like, did you go through anything that kind of w- is at all analogous to to these girls? Yeah, yeah, and so I mean, I had anorexia when I was a teenager, ah. which was, I think, a very similar package of motivations. Where you know, it's not about wanting to be a boy; it's about not wanting to grow up female mm-hmm. and have that body and have those you know reproductive capacities and the discomfort with that and the hatred of um you know sexual development of breasts and periods and things like that and I mean this is just this is to me an almost perfect parallel for most of what we see in these communities which is these girls will be very unsure they'll be questioning you know years after they've transitioned they'll be changing their gender identifications and the consistent theme is but I know I'm not a woman and I know I'm not female and I know you know So it's that rejection of femaleness. And I definitely experienced it and really relate to that. And similar to you, like, I would put it almost exactly the same way where it's like, (sighs) I feel really lucky that I got to be a fucked up teenager and grow up and be okay and not have permanent damage. And I feel a big responsibility to, you know, the next generation of girls and young women who are growing up in a time where the same problems that I had are being routed in a very dangerous direction yeah 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 um so the whole anorexia you know online community Mm -hmm. I have to say the first time I ever heard of pro Anna the pro Anna nation, which is for people who don't know who are listening, you know, it, there's this whole online community of thin spo, which is inspiration yeah. to get thinner, bone spo, inspiration to have your bones showing more. Um, yeah. And the first time I ever heard of this was at school. And yes. looking back on this as an adult, I really think that the well intentioned grown ups were spreading the social contagion. And yes. when I, and at one point I also had the realization it was that same health class that was the first time I heard of cutting and I had never heard of it. It was in middle school. And then, yeah. I don't know, a year or two later, I was, you know, having this like angst, having this like friendship falling apart, my best friend from middle school, yeah. you know, and then so I decided to try that. And bec- and it took me years to remember where was the first time I ever heard of those things. And it was and education. Yeah, it was from the adult world which really kind of made me angry when I realized yes. they're spreading the social contagions in their supposed attempts to yeah you know help yeah that has that has struck me for a long time and with gender it's the same way we're teaching kids like we're going into their schools and telling them well if you have these totally normal feelings it might mean that you're really trans 
but yeah, yeah, like the first place that I learned about anorexia was in health class. Wow. In seventh or eighth grade. Mm-hmm. Um, there was like my peers and I, like we were a little probably about a decade late for the like real bulimia surge, but there was education about bulimia that included, you know, this film with this beautiful like cheerleader actress and a lot of very practical tips about how to be bulimic and hide it from people because she's hiding it in the film. And it sparked like a not a lasting, but like a temporary surge in like girls going to the bathroom and throwing up and you could hear them. Um, and cutting, I think, I think the age difference between us is such that like cutting was very popular when I was in high school, but it wasn't yet taught in the health curriculum. Mm -hmm. as like something to look out for. So it was like right before it crossed that boundary where like, okay, adults are now teaching kids that this is a way to be Mm -hmm. fucked up. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, that's wild. It's really, I'm, I appreciate hearing that you had the same experience where you heard about these social contagions Mm -hmm. from the teachers. Um, That's, so crazy that's so sad that's so frustrating it's kind of and it was you know they it was I feel like with anorexia it was much less kind of romanticized than bulimia with the whole film and everything um but it gave me all of the information that I needed for it to be very appealing like it was like you know if you're anorexic your period might go away and it was like oh my god really (laughs) that was an appeal yeah yeah wow yeah right I mean, who the hell wants their period ever, but especially in middle school and high school. Right, right. right. So when I started, I had that information and it was like, yeah, it's this actionable information. Yeah, that's so, you know, another thing that trans activists were getting mad about at one point, I mean, when are they not getting Mm -hmm. mad, but um, was there was this small news story about girls high school girls being asked for information on their menstrual cycle in order to play sports which is actually completely normal even though it might sound Mm -hmm. strange but the what's behind it is that you have to go to the doctor and get a physical it's not the school or the coach who asks you about your period Mm -hmm. it's going to the doctor and getting a physical and they always ask at every single physical Mm -hmm. when was the date of your last period and um It's very, and actually, I think the reason was in this was in the news was around Roe v. Wade being overturned because people were concerned about menstrual cycles being tracked. But um, this is really important for girls' health because if they over exercise or under eat too much, they will, you know, potentially lose their periods. And so then trans activists, I know, like latched on to that or they latch on to stuff like that in general. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're really downplaying I mean it's really dangerous to say that um that periods are not you know that they're they're buying into this idea that we shouldn't want them we should get rid of them Mm -hmm. even beyond trans activists like people who are huge proponents of the birth control pill and stuff like that they're also perpetuating this idea that like the menstrual cycle is optional or you know it's not and and for some like that could be fine in some cases but they're also maybe inadvertently or maybe not sending the message to people who are struggling with other issues like it's okay to want to get rid of that even by unhealthy means yeah that it's basically this we've considered femaleness particularly to be a problem to be managed with like drugs mostly yeah, exactly. Where it's like, you know, female fertility, menstruation, um, all of these different things that are just like a part of our, you know, a, a young woman is going to naturally be healthy and fertile and menstruating, you know. And I do think that it's really harmful to suggest the idea that it's like, it's okay to kind of desex the female body in this way. And I think that that has helped lead us down the road with like the trans interventions of thinking that parts of being a healthy member of your sex class are just optional yeah yeah right. right exactly and and then I mean you also mentioned you know the girl who was posting about being 24 and never being in a relationship yeah having a double mastectomy and 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 there are things where you might hate them when you're growing up and then they mm-hmm. become 
good when you are older. And that's the case with many of many of, if not all of the things from puberty, really. So we're not giving them a chance to get there um, on their own. We're taking that away from them. I mean, like, you know, growing, growing breasts is a good example. A lot of girls hate that. And they might oh, be yeah. excited about it, like, right before puberty. And then once it hits, it's like, uh-oh, I don't want this. But then yeah. later, you're going to be glad for for a variety of reasons, hopefully. Um, yeah, hopefully. You know. And if not, glad, like, there's also this idea that we should be really thrilled about our bodies and very hard to maintain as you, you know, age or get sick or all of these other things. And it's like, yep. it's not really about, like, am I really happy to have breasts? It's like, it's just accepting what is. Mm. yeah it's like we need to lower the bar from like oh I'm really thrilled to have breasts and really identify as you know like a breast haver and like whatever (laughs) this impossible standard that's being set and just be like yeah this is like a normal healthy part of my body that's a good point a little bit more neutrality um because I mean even even when you get older even if you feel accepted you can still Mm -hmm. you can still like encounter situations or people or you know partners who can destroy that destroy you know positive feelings around that um and I mean ultimately our breasts are really babies so you know (laughs) but um, yeah it's and it's like I don't know there's just been this difficulty to distinguish between what is something about our bodies evolved to do as if that's an automatic value judgment on people who don't want to do that thing Mm -hmm. and so they need to get rid of that part yeah that's interesting right because a lot of these young girls I don't want to have kids I don't want to have kids if that's if that's your truth forever then that's totally fine but I mean you can't make that choice at that age of course but it's but it's even more it's like you said it's it's, okay so then just cut them off like how do you right. get from point A to point B right there? Um, that's a yeah. pretty big leap. That's a pretty big leap. It's like these things are not statements about the kind of person that we want to be or the kind of life that we want to have, but they have become that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, on that note, I, I want to <laughs> keep talking to you forever. I have so much more that I want to ask you and talk to you about, actually. Yeah, so let's I, talk some other time. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, I'd love to have you back on. Um, there's, <laughs> If we had more time, you know, there's so much more I want to get into. I like hearing all your thoughts on everything, even things I want to just kind of present to you, like something I was unsure about, but we'll have to save that for next time. Um, yeah, let's talk more. And Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Eliza. This was so much fun. Um, for everyone listening, I'm going to uh, link Eliza's Substack. Um, I believe Gender Hacked, right, is the name? It's, yes, Gender Hacked, Hacked is the name. Okay, yeah. good. Gender yeah. Hacked. Um, so I'm going to link that below. You know, if you haven't already, you you probably have. If you're watching this channel, you probably are well familiar with Eliza, but please check out her work and support her. She's doing this excellent work. You know, you, you're you brave for doing this. I'm glad that you haven't experienced a lot of cancellation. Like you said, mm-hmm. if you do, people are going to rally around you and support you even more. Um, so I think it's all going to be good. And I'm really excited yes. to see, you know, what else comes from you. So Thanks yeah, so same. I'm really excited for what you do next, too. Wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. All right. Talk Thanks, Eliza.